beauty is a lost art in our post-industrial society. Intricacy and aesthetic detail seem to have vanished into the maw of mass production, and every product we buy and use provides only a sense of sterile utility without invoking anything greater or provoking any pride or wonder. Does it have to be this way? I thought this question recently walking along Great Pulteney Street in Bath. The door knockers of these preserved but still lived in high Georgian houses are wrought iron twisted and moulded motifs of lions, dragons or abstract intricate patterns. They were all stylistically almost identical to each other, but with enough spirit and character to be noticeably unique for each house. A rugged tool to simply let the occupier know that somebody is at the door was treated with great care and drew the user's mind to something greater and far beyond itself. The simple door knocker was something transcendental, and this was commonplace. Contrast this with the now prolific ring doorbell. It's a blank slab of plastic, built to serve a purpose but nothing else. New build streets of copy-paste houses adorned with this copy-paste device. Why is this? Is it because the evocative door knocker was made in an age when cottage industry artisans were so plentiful that thousands of traditional blacksmiths littered the land producing handcrafted works at such a scale to equip entire cities? No. The time when Great Pulteney Street flourished was only a few years behind the setting of Charles Dickens's novels with their infamous depictions of London's harsh urban factory life. The Regency period saw just about the height of the British Empire thanks to the immense works of industry and engineering capable of producing the largest naval fleet ever seen from docks all over the coast and rivers. So to answer my first question, does it need to be this way? The answer is also no. Aesthetic quality and mass industrialization must not be mutually exclusive, as it is proven by the fact that they once did coexist, and you can still go to places where this evidence shows itself. That must mean it was a decision to separate them. It is not the fact that we industrialised which turned our dwellings into bleak, soulless, copy-paste domiciles which resemble pre-packaged, halogen-lit, sterilised dentist offices. We did once rapidly build functional housing with fireplaces, studies, warm electric lighting and inviting wooden decoration which emphasise your part to play in nature rather than separate you from it. Industrialization is not some disembodied force which has made us build and live in psychiatric shoeboxes. That has been the conscious choice of social trendsetters and people with influence in lawmaking, art and academia, as every other area declines around us in tandem. And I could already hear the objection, but those were the houses of the rich. Only the rich could afford to build with creativity, continuity with its surroundings and warmth. So why don't they build that way now? Watch an episode of Grand Designs to see that the average rich person's new build house is a tinted glass, wallless longhouse that could be dropped anywhere in the homogenized world and have no fundamentally different characteristics. The wealthiest areas in countries with new wealth like Dubai or Australia look exactly the same. Garish, geometric, angular, glass. Rich and poor alike live in soulless homes today, but generally lived alike in homes with warmth and soul before. Have a look at this typical expensive holiday home in the countryside of New Zealand. It's not designed to be in harmony with its surroundings, but to be a drab and jarring blot on the landscape so that the occupiers can maximally see outwards to the detriment of the area's beauty, which is the very reason it was built there. Where this thought process leads me to is pondering the future as well, rather than only the past. And I don't think I'm the only one, as various science fiction settings are also seemingly created with this wonder in mind of what a future post-postmodern industrialism could look like, in both reactionary and futurist ways.
Warhammer 40,000 is going from strength to strength at present and has already had over four decades to explore what humanity could be in an ultra dystopian grim darkness of the far future. In this setting, human society continued along essentially the same trajectory as our current one for a few thousand years, reaching the golden age or dark age of technology depending on who you ask. This starfaring, ultra-atheist, ultra-utilitarian society befell the fate of many future dystopian depictions and inadvertently became embroiled in a cataclysmic war with their own AI technology, a war which brought the galaxy-wide civilization to the brink of extinction. After this very narrow victory, the Emperor of Mankind, a mysterious genuine demigod, emerged to unite all of humanity by force and lead them into a great crusade across the stars to build humanity back up again, this time with AI outlawed. At this time, the material culture of humanity was walked back from the ultra-utilitarian ring doorbell aesthetics and philosophy to the neo-gothic megastructures and colourful yet dark depiction that all nerds across the world now know and love. But this was only around the year 30,000, when the Emperor would soon be put in a vegetative state after a demonic rebellion, giving this ultra-atheist human civilization 10,000 years to decline, becoming a highly superstitious and repressive force to a level of magnitude that you can't find in any other piece of fiction. The resulting aesthetic is an incomprehensibly huge industrialism, one big enough to span the whole Milky Way, with the neo-gothic and baroque imperial splendour now adorned with particularly medieval catholic inspired accoutrements such as incense burning in thuribles, blessing of items and weapons adorned with wax and parchment purity seals, the veneration of skeletal relics of saints who were martyred in the service of the now known as God Emperor, and so on. In some relatively recent developments of the story, Rebute Gilliman, Primarch of the famous Ultramarines chapter, has returned. He remembers those days 10,000 years ago when religion was outlawed and the Emperor destroyed anybody who tried to worship him. But Rebute now leads this zealous Imperium with the knowledge that without their devotion to this worship, the human race would be entirely without hope as it fights against multiple cosmic existential threats. Each of these threats are genuinely impossible to defeat on their own, and it seems that their galactic scale efforts have no chance of actually saving them from one of these threats, let alone all of them combined. The devotion of every human to kill and die in the name of the God Emperor creates some beautiful paradoxes in their weapons. The Emperor's Wrath Mark VII Astartes Chainsword is a 1.5 meter long merciless monster of a weapon, but often decorated with gold plating, angelic motifs and the colour of the Space Marines chapter. They are blessed by the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus who pay ritual homage to its machine spirit, and there are around 1 million space marines using these across the galaxy against aliens and demons with hateful holy zeal. The vision of the future material culture of humanity in 40k seems to me a complete inversion of our modern template. The opposite of a ring doorbell is a computer terminal powered by a real human skull with its brain carved up and lobotomized to the point of performing the single task of administering medicine in order to not use AI, made of dark textured steel with a gold trim and glowing accents. What is most fascinating though is that this vision explores the reversal of our aesthetic progress. As we've become more technologically advanced, we have lost religious devotion and a general calling to higher principles at the same time, which I believe to be the true cause of our productive soullessness, and it seems Games Workshop agrees with me. During the golden slash dark age of technology, they had the plain, sterilised aesthetic of ourselves, 
but with the Emperor's emergence, a common cause was reinstated amongst humanity, and they began to take incredible pride in the things they created in the service of his higher cause. With the worship of the God Emperor now the ruling formula, and the sheer gritted teeth resilience of the human spirit being the only thing keeping them from extinction, the dial is cranked up to 11, and answers my question of does it need to be this way with the loudest thundering no possible. Their spaceships are flying cathedrals, the titans are walking cathedrals, the factories themselves are cathedrals. Human domiciles, to bring us back to housing, are not nice at all as this is a story of extremes, pushing fiction to the limits of what a powerful yet impossibly desperate civilization could look like. You can hear people ask, why did the medieval church build cathedrals in splendour when that money could have fed the poor? And the person asking within their comfortable modern context does not appreciate that such a peasant could be lucky to ever see a single cathedral in their whole life, and it would be the most beautiful and magnificent thing they would ever see. That experience is far more hopeful than an unnoticeable 1% increase in their daily standard of living if the money used was instead just a handout to the entire working class. It's in the darkest, poorest, and most desperate times when symbols of overwhelming hope are needed, and that is why our church's history and the Imperium's future build in such a grandiose way. Barrett Holmes and the Shard fill nobody with hope. And the material culture of the UNSC in the Halo series fascinates me with equal measure, but for its subdued way of answering the question in a manner which is again paradoxical, but for the opposite reasons. The uniqueness, beauty, and human fingerprint within a highly industrial setting is treated in a manner which is essentially intangible, non-physical, even spiritual. The first game is my favourite of all, but as it laid the groundwork for a very stark, angular, almost brutalist design language for humanity's depiction, you may be scratching your head as to where I'm going. What I mean can be demonstrated by the ship which plays such a key role in Combat Evolved, that being the Pillar of Autumn. If you're familiar with Halo, you might have wondered what the deal was with the names of the ships and already see the paradox. The Pillar, in its original Xbox graphics most especially, looks almost like it's made out of concrete, and you could be forgiven for thinking that the design is in essence brutalist. In truth, the design language is more inspired by Italian futurism, which itself was quite a lightning in a bottle moment, and a style which actually translates incredibly well to comic book adaptations more than video games. This art philosophy is shown particularly well in this sculpture of Mussolini's head of all things, which is accurate yet abstract, static yet dynamic, and industrial yet intricate. It is architectural paradoxy which makes sense, only furthering that very paradox. What the Pillar of Autumn lacks in visual detail it makes up for in meaning, both prescribed in its creation and imbued with the human contribution to its mission. What I love most is how unique its name is. It's not a reference to any sort of pre-existing myth or society, whereas much of 40k's humanity is a callback to ancient and medieval European societies. The pillar's name is creatively its own symbol, implying that it is the final thing holding up humanity's autumn, and with its destruction our winter begins as the war with the Covenant becomes an existential fight for our species' survival. Other great examples of a spiritual meaning in the naming of these jagged dark ships are in amber clad, denoting the purpose of survival and preservation like fossils preserved in amber. The forward unto dawn, which sounds like another gritted teeth call to resilience, to fight bitterly through the cold dark night to reach the warmth of a new day. And the spirit of fire, which evokes in me thoughts of the control of fire being humanity's first expression of rational resource manipulation, an amazing power which we harness to both create and destroy. 
This ship in particular appears mostly in later games made by 343 rather than Bungie, which I think can explain how it does break the traditional simplicity of symbolism I mentioned before, because it perhaps recalls the story of Prometheus from Greek myth, who bestowed the power of fire onto humanity and was punished by the Olympians for it. Religion is a funny one in Halo's fabric. On the surface, it could seem to be outright antagonistic to religion in general, with the Covenant Prophets being false prophets waging a suicidal holy war with the aim of destroying all sentient life in the universe. But this blanket prescription is too myopic and neglects the heavy use of symbolism in the series which was demonstrated above. The Covenant is a very on-the-nose depiction of false religion, but it can be argued that humanity follows an allegorical story of true religion, in particular of course, Christianity. Some may sneer at this notion until you ask them why the Flood and the Ark have their names, and then the pages do start to turn themselves. The Master Chief's only known name is a code name, John 117. Rephrase it as John 117 and you get a Bible verse which reads, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. To me, Moses in this context is analogised by the ancient forerunner society, and with Master Chief John being the profoundly messianic, death-defying figure in the series, represents Jesus Christ who came to fulfil the law of Moses, as Chief comes to fulfil the Forerunner's mantle of responsibility, by liberating, defending and protecting sentience in the universe. I don't believe that these are used to portray either a pro or anti-Christian message, but a repackaging of certain themes therein to show how Chief and his mission achieve the same thing as the veneration of the God Emperor. That is the human need for transcendence, hope and a cause greater than oneself in order to endure anything and sacrifice everything for nothing less than survival. Halo design is the perfect complement to explore alongside 40k, as I think it's clear that the 40k aesthetic is a reactionary look at humanity's future material culture, whilst Halo's is futurist. When you realise that it is in fact not brutalist, which is instead the peak of modernism, you can understand why when you look at more than just the ships, the design of the weapons, armour and architecture, the UNSC feels profoundly human and I say feels rather than looks deliberately. Despite being called Spartans, the equipment of those bio-engineered super soldiers does not have any obvious historical references, unlike the Ultramarines with their clear classical Roman embellishments. Now here are some ways in which tools can be applied to meaning. Reaction looks in a mirror, futurism looks through a telescope, and modernism looks down a microscope. The mirror looks backwards and has the gift of hindsight, if used properly, to see both what was beautiful and what was corrupted. The telescope discovers whole things anew to be used for good or for evil, but the microscope is solely pernicious. It breaks down holes into their parts, strips them of any cohesion and transcendence, and atomizes the people who use it. In this sense, I think we can't say that a reactionary or futurist designed for humanity is either good or bad, as both must be used as a tool with caution. Unsurprisingly, I think this is best resolved through the use of a neo-reactionary perspective, which combines the two, such as our mission of a patchwork model of the old Holy Roman Empire made up of new CEO kings. The best depiction of this method in sci-fi so far has been Dune, but maybe that's a discussion for another day. 
For now, what I think matters is to see why things do not need to be the way that they are. The ring doorbell can be binned, the microscope smashed, and things both were better and can be better. This all makes sense to me, but I hope I haven't given you whiplash from the rapid tone shift and can see how it fits into the wider point. Hope and meaning are critical to our lives, not just a luxury or nice to have, but they're impossible to find in the grim bleakness of the modern world. Look both backwards and forwards for it, and you'll find it in spades. Take it easy.